podcast. Welcome to part two of Shadow of Night. We're discussing uh, chapters eight and nine today, which takes us into France to set door and to meet Philippe de Clermont. Yes, and what has been several weeks for you has really been mere moments for us. <laughs> we are just rolling right through into our next discussion, which is very ex- exciting because we have all of our thoughts at the top of our heads. <laughs> And we've been so excited to get to these Philippe chapters because, guys, I'm going to make no secret of this. Philippe is one of my favorite characters ever, period, paragraph. Like, I adore Philippe. I'm going to be making lots of unattractive noises about Philippe for the next couple chapters. And you guys are just going to have to put up with it or not listen to this episode, I guess. Like, those are your I know. I feel like a lot of our listeners, though, are, like, definitely in the same camp. <laughs> Okay. Right, <laughs> we have found our people. Yes. Yes. <laughs> team Philippe. Mm-hmm. Team Philippe all the way. Um, while well, I realized Team Kit is apparently not a thing. So I, I am determined that person is out there. I know they are. <laughs> <laughs> that person is out there. And you know what? If they could give me, like, if they could give me the kind of perspective on Kit Marlowe that, like, elevates my feelings of pity and pathos and undermines my feelings of contempt, then I am all about that conversation. We just need 10 minutes of your time. <laughs> but right now, these chapters are blessedly free of kids and full of sleep. Yeah, this whole section, in fact. Thank the Lord. <laughs> you could even say they're fully. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I, I don't think you're I, really I'm, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Also here for another book and a half. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Shall we do a chapter summary or is there anything else we'd like to say before we go into it? There's lots we have to say. Most of it's ridiculous. So go ahead and do your summary <laughs> and then we'll go back. Yeah, to see. It. Here we go. <laughs> Let me go to my summary notes. Uh, so at the beginning of chapter eight, we are introduced to part two of Shadow of Night, Set Tour and the village of Saint Lucien. And at the beginning of chapter eight, we are in a boat headed for Mont Saint Michel, which is on the coast of France. We are beating feet to get ourselves to Set Tour in time for Philippe's imposed deadline, by which point Matthew must arrive or Philippe will believe that he is dead and apparently wage war. So we spend a lot of chapter eight traveling to Set Tour. We are introduced to Philippe at Set Tour after we go through a conversation about how different it is from its modern day iteration. No surprise there, guys. But we meet Philippe, who has been built up in our imagination as this incredibly assertive and powerful and dominant figure and we meet Philippe and then Diana makes I think the very important strategic choice to just tell Philippe the truth because Philippe's gonna know everything anyway and then basically in capital letters I have written not mated what (laughs) (laughs) so we have yet another wedge of conflict that is driven between Matthew and Diana and watching Matthew and Diana Uh, work around the complicated dynamic that is Philippe and Matthew's relationship and how Diana is coming into her own and becoming not only a woman of the time, but a woman of her own self. And then uh, we do a lot of housekeeping in chapter nine and a lot of hunting, but that discussion is really, I think, about Diana learning to manage herself and taking a role in trying to resolve some of Matthew's problems or resolve some of the issues of being in the past and confronted with Philippe again. So while there's a lot of like going to the kitchen to see chef, while there's a lot of talk of partridge and stag blood, um, there is some feasting, there is some cleaning, there is some walking in circles around the library because you don't know what else to do. There are some herbs, there's Mart's room. We take like a tour of set tours in the 15th, 16th century. And then at the end of the chapter, um, we go to bed, I think. We serve we serve blood. No, we oh, don't. You're right. We don't even go to blood. They just like yeah, they just have blood and she's like, "I hope you will go hunting tomorrow and the day after." Right. She basically <laughs> performs the role of a 16th century chatelaine, uh, which demonstrates that perhaps yeah. she's not as bad of an actress as we gave her credit for. So, yeah, yeah. that's uh that's sort of mm-hmm. like the the summary of 8 and 9. <sighs> mhm. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we're very excited to talk about Philippe. We have a couple things we have to talk about pre-Philippe. One of them is that uh, in this moment when they're on the boat going to uh, this uh, Saint-Michel, Diana is everyone's mom. (laughs) 
Diana's everyone's mom in the world. Callow glass the wall. She's everyone's mom when you're learning to drive. Fun fact, boys and girls, Mama Kate actually <laughs> followed me to school the first day that I had my driver's license in another car because she was afraid that I was going to crash into a tree, uh... never mind the fact that she just spent a year and a half teaching me how to drive. So yes, Diana, thank you for channeling mm. my mother, who still, by the way, uses her feet to press the imaginary brake in the passenger seat. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That is my mom when my dad is driving and she's in the car. But let it be known, my mother also drives like a bat out of hell. <laughs> it's just when other people are driving. Yeah. So, you know, Diana channeling everyone's mom everywhere <laughs> right, for in all, all times. Time. The image <laughs> of the persnickety, confused, like overprotective mother in a vehicle is just, that is eternal. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, but the other thing that we get here right at the beginning is we get some gallo glass backstory which I am happy to have more gallo glass every time he is there. Um, and this discussion of the contention in the family and gallo glass's um, difficulty with Philippe and with the family currently in 1590, which is that his father, Hugh, who was Philippe's son, one of Philippe's sons, was uh, murdered and nobody apparently did anything about it. And gallo glass is a bit put out. <laughs> I think it is fair to say a bit put out. But I also think (laughs) that it's interesting on page 97 when Matthew has this moment of, of sort of clarity and grief and magnanimity where he says to Gallo Glass, like, maybe this choice you're making is because you assume that your opportunities to be with someone you love are infinite. And we never, ever know that. And Matthew can only say that, obviously, because he's 2010 Matthew coming back to 1590, and he knows that Philippe is gone. But this idea that, like, I think that these two chapters have a lot to say about remembrance and history and how you interact with your own history. In fact, I think that that's one of the things this Philippe section is doing. And so for Matthew to have the perspicacity to say don't let what you remember be the reason that you don't love the person or the experience or the time that you have. Right. Yeah. And like you said, this, this Matthew has the, the hindsight and he is able to actually use it because he has gone to the past. (laughs) So he has actually quite a lot of insight that he can share with Galloglass. Now, whether or not Galloglass, you know, takes that advice. Yeah, it is not clear <laughs> to me from page 97, because I don't, we don't get it from Galloglass's perspective, whether Galloglass realizes that this is coming from a Matthew who has seen Philippe's demise, because that if you are Galloglass, who we know knows that Matthew is coming from the future, like Galloglass knows that Matthew and Diana have time walked you could read a lot into that sentence if you're gallo glass that there will come a time when there is no philippe left right and either i don't want to say he's not paying attention because i feel like gallo glass is the person who like is in the background always paying attention um but perhaps he's just not ready to he's not in that place yet where he can understand and receive that advice from matthew and um, understand that that is the perspective that Matthew has. <clears throat> because he's still very angry. <laughs> the perspective that Matthew has on Gallo Glass, not the perspective that Matthew has on himself, which is very interesting because Matthew and his anger and his grief and looking at the past are one of the things that caused him to shortchange his present and his future. And so I think it's very interesting that Matthew has noticed this thing about Galaglass that he is not capable of noticing or addressing within himself. Then we have a pissing contest with some clergy. We do. (laughs) And we are putting quite a lot of weight onto all of these different aspects of Matthew's, like, quote-unquote, identity, or these, like, pieces of Matthew. And this one is not particularly important or interesting, to me at least. Right, um, because Matthew's basically posturing, and he's basically saying, like, my dog is bigger than your dog. You know, like, I have more power behind me 
than you have behind you. And the thing that maybe I see in this scene is both a discussion of Matthew's adaptability. I mean, his his ability to be extraordinarily political and uh, in every situation in which you place him. But then again, I'm going to come back to the performance of masculinity. Like Matthew is displaying a certain aspect of dominance. It's interesting, though, that it's kind of a derivative dominance. It's not necessarily about him. It's about who and what he represents, which is to say that he is he is the son of like he has power, but it is subordinate to the power and influence of Philippe. But it is extraordinarily performative. I also think it's interesting that Diana refers to it as metamorphosis as though, and I like that choice of words, or I think it's chewy because of the reference it's making to the idea of alchemy, that like you have these elements of Matthew's identity that are mutable depending on how you mix them and in what solution you place him. You know, he can either be like, he can flow from substance to substance by virtue of his context, whereas Diana, for all of the things that she's supposed to represent, is actually remarkably constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of brings back the Mercury imagery a little bit that we use for Diana. And in this book, at least so far, it applies much more to Matthew than it does to Diana, um, that particular metaphor. So, yes, indeedy. Um, you know what I think of most of in the beginning of this chapter, right up till we get and we actually meet Philippe, is that I am freezing. <laughs> like I read this and I'm like need like a blanket because I'm like cold, 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 cold. cold. I also see this scene as like being the confrontation between the um, the uh, knight and the clergyman in the magnificent 1980s movie Lady Hawk. Mm. So that's kind of how I see it. Yes. I know it's not quite right, but that's the image Lady I have in my head. Hawk. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about Lady Hawk in a special episode another time. But suffice to say that there's a renaissance and there's forbidden love and there's like a very bad clergyman and a very bad Ooh. bishop, I believe. And some amazing 80s special effects. And a great synthesizer soundtrack and Matthew Ooh, Broderick. And Matthew Broderick. And who's the woman? Uh, it's Michelle Pfeiffer. It is and Michelle Pfeiffer, yes. I was I was thinking it was it was Michelle Pfeiffer, yes. And yes. Rooker Hauer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a personal favorite. I made Mr. Kate no, I watch it. Love Lady during <laughs> I, I made Mr. Kate watch it during a snowstorm and he still hasn't forgiven me. So <laughs> If you haven't seen it, maybe don't. Uh, maybe it's just special to me. Or maybe but. do. No, I love it. I love Lady Hawk. It gets a dual. It gets a dual recommendation. Indeed, anyway. a dual recommendation with the reservation that you may not love it the way that we do, and that's fine. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> love what you love. Um, so yes, also cold. Also, why do we have to ride so fast? Also, like, I appreciate a little bit the the briskness of the pacing of this chapter to get us to set tour. But at the same time, I would be an ice cube. A literal one, not a figure. I would have all the frostbite. <laughs> this lady clothing is just simply not sufficient to keep out any of the chills. <laughs> it does make me uncomfortable. And the idea of poor Matthew just like kneeling on a stone floor, even though I know he probably can't feel it because he's a vampire. Like the one good thing that being a vampire is good for pardon me the one thing that being a vampire is good for is i guess kneeling on a stone cold floor because you wouldn't feel it but we wouldn't feel the cold or you wouldn't feel the stones like i feel like his knees are still like 1500 year old knees you know like and he's kneeling on a hard stone no that's not how i that think works. that if that were the case then vampire 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 blood is not very useful at all <laughs> If you still have the same joints <laughs> you would have had, but if they're 1,500 years old, like, that stuff is not as strong as they made it out to be. Uh, or if it healed everything <laughs> but your knees. Um, fun fact. Uh, most of your joints, particularly the synovial ones, like the cartilage and stuff, it doesn't have blood flow. So <laughs> my argument is still valid. 
That's why, in fact, joints break down so quickly is because they don't have the restoration of having blood flow to, like, restore them and heal them. So they just, like, break down Fine. and there's nothing to fix them. <laughs> I know, I'm that guy. I'm just so, my arguments still stay up. Truth is no defense for fiction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, poor Creaky Matthew is uh, kneeling on the floor of Mont Saint Michel, and uh, Diana is uh, pondering to herself this very difficult question. Um, you know, Milord is himself, but is he still mine? Drama, false conflict. Right. Right. That's Diana being a little bit dramatic. Being a little bit dramatic. I mean, <laughs> could come from cold. I know people that are dramatic when they're cold. Um, I'm very dramatic when I'm cold. <laughs> this is good to know. But uh, I wonder, again, whether that is... We talked a little bit in some of our previous episodes about the idea of conflict and authorial confidence and whether that is truly meant to be a note of false conflict or whether the author is just not whether the the narrative voice is not sure whether we get that there is conflict between Matthew and Diana or that Diana is insecure about her position vis-a-vis -vis Matthew and I think that it's an unnecessary it's an unnecessary note because I think it sounds out of character to me it doesn't sound like something that Diana would say because she doesn't really have a lot of these like introspective like I'm going to question the universe type moments so it feels a little inauthentic to me but then also it feels like it's trying to drive home the idea that like Matthew and Diana are not okay which I think we already know we definitely got that in chapter one um yeah I, I do lean towards it being more of just a little bit of authorial discomfort and having a little bit of like lack of faith in the reader because we're like trying something super new and trying to do all of these things in this book and therefore um, we just uh, lack a little bit of confidence sometimes. And do you think that this that the the lack of confidence is coming from a lack of confidence in where we're going with Philippe? Do you think it's a lack of confidence in the idea that we have this? ostensibly we have a romance story where the end of the story is supposed to be the happy ever after the fulfillment of Matthew and Diana through their love of each other their their improved and increased worthiness for one another their redemption of one another through love that we have to is that because we're unsure about problematizing that or because we are not comfortable with the way in which we're about to do it or the choices that we've made to take Matthew back to let's say, a less evolved version of himself. Maybe all of those things. And maybe maybe just simply that because the idea was for Shadow of Night to do something completely new and different from A Discovery of Witches, that in addition to juggling all of these pieces that must necessarily be juggled plot-wise, we're also trying to add this whole other layer onto it of, you know, being historical fiction and having, you know, piece. so... That's just a lot. And, like, it's not a negative thing to say, like, you know, any author can be, like, have, like, stumbles and be uncomfortable doing something that is this complex and is this new, right? Um, and although I think with that we're not necessarily messing with the happily ever after, because I think if it is a trilogy, the happily ever after is at the end of the third book, and we get, like, the happy for now at the end of discovery of witches right certainly but to the extent that the promise yeah. of the romance genre is a forever after you know monogamous pair bonding yeah, um... well, <laughs> I, well I, I think it could be either or I think it could be certainly like traditionally classically happily ever after right but I think a lot of what you get in more contemporary romance is like the happy for now so Kind Certainly, but I think with yeah. the understanding that, like, this is meant to be and therefore, like, whatever wobbles you have right. in the future will never upset the core of true and redemptive love, mm -hmm. um, which is yeah. just a, a 
fascinating concept to talk about in terms of patriarchy and i'll get there eventually because like we deal with the real patriarch uh in the next chapter like the actual factual like definitional patriarch um so uh, there's that but well we are we are certainly aiming at at the more epic right you know, but so when we do <laughs> this was he still mine right this premise this idea seems to undermine it seems to undercut that fundamental promise of like everything will be okay and suggest that there will be a moment or there's a possibility for a moment where you have as there are in some other romance stories actually a period where the characters break up and split apart and I think that that is just kind of a tonal hiccup for me because I don't think that's what we're actually doing so I wonder why we take the time to do it here. I do, I really think that it, that is not the intention, that it is much more like a lack of confidence. Um, because we've done an, a lot of, and actually a very good job of showing their relationship conflict in section one, and now we're telling it, and it doesn't work. <laughs> so, anyway. All that work for one little sentence. <laughs> I know. But it was that's important. Why, that's why That's why we chew on these things yeah. one word at a time. Yes. Because that's kind of our method. Yes. And sometimes we get caught on words that other people don't get caught on. And that's okay. Sometimes Jen gets caught on words that other people don't get caught uh, on. I get caught on words you that do. other people don't. You do. We both do. <laughs> yeah. Like, there, we all have hiccups. But anyways, um, we get... In really pages 99 through 102, we sort of like briskly take us to Septura and try and give like a snapshot of the role that Philippe plays in the geopolitics of France at the time. And the idea I think that we take away from it is really just that Philippe is generally out for whatever Philippe thinks is best for himself, his family, and the things he cares about, and uh, hang everything else. Yes. And briskly is certainly the correct word because, again, we're basically frozen to death by the time we get to Septuors. <laughs> Diana can't feel her bum and I can't feel my feelings. Right. You know when you can't feel your butt anymore, like, there's trouble. <laughs> correct. Because there's a lot of fat down there. <laughs> and we, we build up on page 102 this sort of classical idea of uh, standing and sort of, like, looking at Satur from the outside, which is an image that we return to several times in the series. We did it in The Discovery of Witches. Uh, we do it in this book. We are going to do it again. And I, and I think that there's something to that because I, I think that we are doing something every time we go to Satur that is thematically connected but i haven't quite unpicked what i think it is mm. perhaps we'll have to like hold on to it until we get all of the instances and maybe then we'll be able to to see but it is very much like the the fairy tale knight and his lady on the hilltop on horseback while they are freezing while well, she is anyway <laughs> overlooking the castle it's also a pretty common romance fiction trope you uh, know especially when you have as you often do bringing your lady home <laughs> right you're home to your ancestral seat right it certainly uh, happens in outlander <laughs> you I had was, to do that didn't you I know, you sorry. had to you just Has it was there don't add us about outlander we've been so good for like three episodes we've cited so many other stories i'm sorry Right. Go on. <laughs> but so the uh, the idea of bringing your lady home to your ancestral, uh, the ancestral seat of your family, the locus of power, and there is this thing that we're doing with the gender and the romance and the politics again, where like most of these heroes that we look at or these male figures are figures who are in one way or another so powerful in and of themselves that the woman's power doesn't threaten them. Right? Or at least doesn't threaten them in that particular way. Like, they can afford to, like, let the woman do woman stuff. And that's the thing we're going to have to unpick at some point. Because I don't know that that's where we end, but I think that that's, like, that's a conversation we didn't have during A Discovery of Witches that was mm -hmm. maybe useful. Like, um, what we expect of the romantic hero coming home. Mm -hmm. And, like, how the romantic heroine is supposed to fit into that framework of where he comes from. Yeah. 
we certainly don't do the same thing when we go back to Diana's ancestral home. That's for sure. No, we certainly don't. It's uh, it's much less. um, It's fraught in different ways, I think. Um, But we come to Satur, and on page one hundred and three, we get Alain. Yay! In person. (laughs) I love that later in this chapter, she says that Alain smells like wax and cracked pepper. Two very like homey scents mm-hmm. that just like I don't know. I think I would find that comforting, except he would probably make me sneeze. Right, that's what I always I think with the when she says the pepper, I'm like, he sounds sneezy. <laughs> sneezy the house dwarf. <laughs> Poor Ella. I'm sorry, Ella. You're lovely. You're so- otherwise. You suffer through so much. Good and loyal, and you're present in 2010, and you're present now, and we do like you, <laughs> and we'll continue to like you. And then we get to meet Philippe. We've got a little bit before we, a little bit before we get to Philippe. We do build up the meeting with Philippe like a good deal. Yeah, we do have I like think... the grump. He's not in a good mood today. Rumble, rumble. <laughs> rumble, rumble, grumble, grumble. But we do also have like historian Diana, who is also like, trying not to think too hard diana you know looking at the 16th century version of Setour and seeing like the village of saint lucien and all of the craftsmen and everything um all of the the period decorations and being like cool Mm -hmm. we get to look at the furniture again (laughs) right because historian diana is looking for something to think about other than her freezing reunion with his long dead father yeah and the fact that she's freezing to death Probably also. That's what I would be thinking about. I would not be thinking about the reunion with my husband's long dead father. <laughs> the truth. But I, I love, I do love the, the empathy and loyalty with which she approaches her first meeting of Philippe. That she's going to be there because it's what Matthew needs. Never mind that Philippe has ordered it, but it's definitely what she believes that her partner needs. And that's a really lovely thing even if i think that sometimes she has been indulging matthew's feelings a little bit too much um i think that this is a place where she's actually doing a really good job of reading her partner which is nice i love that philippe speaks greek i love it yeah i don't know why i love it but i really do pretty cool (laughs) I, you know, I, it might actually be from the audiobooks that Jennifer Ikeda does such an amazing job of voicing Philippe, in my opinion, that I just hear her sort of drawling in Troy <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> And it works really well for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the idea that he is confident enough in his authority that he didn't care what language you speak. He is speaking his language mm-hmm. to you. Yeah. It's good stuff. Philippe's really good. Here's my thing with Philippe, though. I feel like a little bit that Philippe is so well written that he doesn't need to be talked up quite as much as he is. We do lots and lots and lots of telling, 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 telling about Philippe, but he's so well written that you don't need any of that. <laughs> You just need him to show up. <laughs> you just need to sh- him to show up and Philippe yes. all over the page. Yes. And when he Philippe's all over the page. Episode um, title, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. I think that he comes to life. And to the extent that that's a, that that's a, a manifestation of authorial insecurity, which it might be. Mm. That, the telling um, part, not the... The telling yeah. part, certainly. Yeah. And then I think that raises the question of, like, how much of what we are quote-unquote told about Philippe vis-a-vis other characters is actually true Philippe, or whether that is, say, a conscious construction of Philippe's persona that he projects, or just people, or the narrator, misunderstanding what Philippe is and what Philippe is doing. The narrator or the author? The authorial voice Uh, or the narrator voice? I think you could have different answers for both of those things. I mean, the point is that he's, like, very, very (laughs) well-written. And he is larger than life on the page, and you just don't need to build him up. You just don't. (laughs) Yeah, and... uh, 
Philippe is such, he's so well drawn and he's such a, a magnificent foil for Matthew. Like he shows you that for all of what we have been shown of Matthew's, for lack of a better word, maturity, that like true power and true security and true... I'm going to use the word like true, true dominance and authority it looks like something very different. Mm-hmm. Matthew ain't got nothing on over Philippe <laughs> in comparison. The current iteration of Matthew. Right. And I think that. Yeah. You know, the extent to which we can talk about whether Philippe is truly benevolent, right? Or whether, you know, Philippe really does know best, whether he's really all powerful and all knowing as the text seems to want us to believe him to be, whether that's a product of his his age or, you know, just that he's exceptionally clever or whatever it is. He certainly presents a different version of how to be a male vampire than Matthew. And he, he displays, like, how far Matthew has yet to grow. Not just in his relationship with Diana, but in general. In, in life. <laughs> mm-hmm. In his extended lifespan. If we do get that Philippe is quite old, he is in fact, by the time he meets his end, certainly much older than Matthew. <laughs> Millennia older than Matthew. Yeah, he's just really cool. Like, what can I say about Philippe that's not... I really appreciate the fact that Diane is just like, I will not be lying to this man. (laughs) But on the other hand, you have Matthew who's like, what are you doing? (laughs) Right. But so I, I, the reason that I love that moment and that we're on 107, right? Where Matthew tries to evade Philippe and Diana, whose approach to everything so far has been to run away at full speed goes not here. I am not running here because I cannot. And that is such a wonderful and subtle moment of growth for her to say, nope, can't, can't wiggle here. Can't wiggle, can't run, have to face it. Yeah. And this is certainly a person that you cannot sidestep. You have to be straightforward with them. And that, in fact, Philippe respects people who are straightforward with him more. <laughs> than people who are not. And it also shows, you know, quite a difference in that we've talked about how Matthew is not really the strategist. Um, and But Diana, it would appear, is uh, a bit more strategically minded than Matthew because his thought is like, we don't need to tell him everything, do we? And we're like, have you met your father, Matthew? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, there's a part of it that's doing like this really – wonderful thing with Matthew with Diana deciding that if she is going to have any chance of being Philippe's equal or of being treated with respect in Philippe's household then she has to do him the honor of not trying to mess with him right she has to do the honor of telling him the truth and then there's also this sort of like subtextual it's like two teenagers got caught out at night and they're in front of the dad and one of them's like I think we're gonna lie about this and the other one's like yeah no we're screwed the other one's like yeah we totally did it (laughs) Yeah, totally did it. Not only did we do it, but here's the receipt. Yeah. <laughs> we accept our punishment. <laughs> right. Uh, we decided to err on the side of forgiveness, not permission. Real sorry. But I love that Diana, she makes that choice. She makes it independent of Matthew, knowing that Matthew doesn't want her to do it. And she says, nope, this is the right choice for us right now. And that, mwah. Yay, Diana. And I love Philippe's response. Oh, I'm well aware of what you are. Yeah. And Matthew being like, what? Like, of course, you know, like if Galaglass can like smell it or, you know, Galaglass has sent word as well. But of course, like Philippe knows he can smell it too. And he's a smart guy. <laughs> also, like Matthew's pretty arrogant, guys. If if Philippe is so much older, of course, he's probably run into witches before and probably witches like Diana and probably witches that do Diana-like things. Maybe not all of them at once because Diana is the witchiest witch who ever witched. Yes. But but elements of Diana. Mm-hmm. He's, he smelled them before. <laughs> he smelled her kind before. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Oh, and I, I actually really, really love all of his digs at Matthew, like, in this chapter. <laughs> Especially the part where, like, she tells this whole story, and he's like, you have a gift of telling things really succinctly. Please teach this to Matthew. The whole family could benefit. <laughs> And the only thing that I don't like about the way that she recounts uh, this to Philippe is that it highlights how efficiently we could have done this in chapter one had we just not done the narrator voiceover type bits where it's fine when she tells it to the school of night or when they tell that concocted sort of quasi story to the school of night. But then to get it a second time here and to get it literally in the space of two pages, like all of the detail or like all of the the really important movements of the story mm -hmm. and then stop yeah like a barely two pages like barely two pages <laughs> yeah and then it, it also this is part of why sometimes when i talk about shadow of night being uneven mm -hmm. when you contrast the confidence of chapter eight mm -hmm. with the in my opinion authorial insecurity of chapter one mm -hmm. you're like you can do it! Mm -hmm. Why don't you just do it? <laughs> right. So part one, I mean, is almost like the warm-up. Like, we're mm -hmm. warmed up now. We're gonna go. <laughs> right. Getting ready for the ski jump. And then by the time we get to Philippe, we're flying. Like, and we're doing some really wonderful work. And it just, I find it very frustrating that we don't just do the work. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. But here we are now. Here we are. This is, here we are. We are he's, in Sekur. He's okay. <laughs> It's okay. I and then, um And then what happens, Kate? <laughs> well, are we there yet? I mean, we kind of are. Well, we we could talk about um, we could talk about the ring because that happens on one eleven, right? Yes, I think I think that I think that we should talk about um. A little bit about the conflict between Matthew and Philippe on 110 and 111 and how we are setting ourselves up for what chapter two is about and this conversation about masculinity and paternity <laughs> and like and what it means to love respect fear and sometimes disagree with your father and like enter familial conflict I think that that's like setting up a lot of really wonderful juicy stuff I'm doing a little bit of like a juicy stuff dance over here that's a little like, a little like the thriller, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should certainly um, talk about those things before we talk about the other thing, <laughs> and we could talk about well, Izzy Boo a tiny bit as well. <laughs> okay, right. I, I was just going to stick a pin in those ideas okay. for like what we are doing with Matthew and Philippe. I think during part two of this book, which is that we are problematizing Matthew's authority and the idea of paternal authority and the idea of like family and dominance. And of course we're doing the masculinity thing again. Um, and uh, guilt, shame, remembrance, doing all of those things. Yeah. Well, and I think mm, we can certainly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is certainly a chapter 10 and 11 a uh, little bit tiny bit of of conversation but um we are certainly betraying the fact that Matthew is very angry at Philippe and the reason he is angry at Philippe is because Philippe is gone <laughs> yeah um and the way in which that happens we certainly get to talk about in this section soon not yet, but like uh, Matthew is super angry at Philippe, you guys. <laughs> well, but that goes back into our conversation about Matthew's inability, like Matthew not having what it takes to process grief, and the idea that Matthew never, I never comes to, he has never come to acceptance in his entire life. And one of the challenges that Philippe as a character poses to that, I think, is that Philippe for all of his agency is also extremely prepared for acceptance and forgiveness in a way that Matthew is not. And like Matthew's anger at his father and his demands that he's making of his father 
in 110 and 111 are, are heartbreaking and that he's trying so hard to just do this and get out of there before in my opinion he reveals what's wrong yes yeah and like the extent he can actually cope with being in philippe's presence like for presence for what amount of time matthew is capable of like just holding on to this (laughs) right yeah anyway we get to continue that conversation next episode (laughs) And I'm just going to point out the magnificence of 111 when Diana forces Philippe to look at her and she makes the choice for them both and says, this is not Matthew's fault. Let me stay here tonight and I will figure something else out. If you're not going to help, then we're not going to bother you any longer. We will leave because that is the best choice that that I can make from here and now. And she does it on her own. I mean, because she has has to. She's really the only person in the room capable of making that decision, and she does. <laughs> She's the only one capable of breaking this stalemate yeah. between Matthew and his father and the unresolved anger and grief. Mm-hmm. And I actually, I really love the scene with the ring. Mm, a lot. Yes. It's really mm-hmm. good. It's really, really, it's, it's masterful mm-hmm. work. Yeah. So Philippe sees the ring, and he's like, Hold on a second. <laughs> That's not your ring, lady. <laughs> That's my wife's ring. <laughs> Where did you get it? And what it forces from Matthew. Like, I like that we get this out of the way very quickly. You know, we've only been with Philippe for three pages, and we finally... I like how... how tightly crafted this conflict is set up and then the conflict is sort of resolved but then also complicated in the sense that this one thing like Philippe now knows the worst thing but that doesn't make the rest of this any any easier um and I like how tightly that's done and that it's very tight in fact it's only like three quarters of a page but it's so emotive and so effective for Matthew to put yeah. it in context of his mother to say she lives, Philippe, and it's awful. Yeah, that it's awful because in that next page you get the conflict mm. that that little moment between Diana and Philippe where he really just wants it to be Isabeau's hand that he's holding and he's yeah. not, and he's just yeah. learned that he's not immortal, and yeah. the person from whom he learned that and the person he's with is not Isabeau, and oh, oh, Philippe. <laughs> Yeah. Although it is a token of hers, it is not like herself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> By the way, the fact that um, Isabeau is not here at Set Tours and therefore cannot in the future remember Diana and Matthew being there, like, because she is not present at Set Tour in 1590, it goes in the stable time loop basket. <laughs> she She doesn't know about it because she was never there. <laughs> so. And and then we have to talk about the thing now. Page 112, everybody. Let's talk about vampire mating. Or not, as the case may be. (laughs) Yeah. This goes, remember in way, way back. In Discovery Witches, when we said that it was, like, super important to do some stuff with informed consent and getting married, that includes knowing what it means to be married to your partner in the eyes of their community. Kind of, kind of a big deal. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's just, let's begin at the beginning. One, they're, they're not mated, so their togetherness is is not important in the eyes of vampires. Two, as I pointed out, they are not married in the eyes of the church either, as Philippe points out, um, because turns out saying vows to each other on the floor in your living room doesn't count. (laughs) Um, Three, it is evident in this conversation that Matthew knew all of this and is backpedaling heavily. (laughs) (laughs) And also, it makes the whole accidental marriage thing 
even worse when he comes home and is like, you and I are one now, and then refers to her as his wife. Yeah, exactly. Cue the hyperventilating. You knew at the time when you said that, like, ridiculously oh. shocking thing. <laughs> you knew that wasn't true. That it was. Okay, 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 A okay, lie. okay, okay. So, we have a choice. We can mm. either see that as Matthew being a liar, liar, pants on fire, or we can see it as an authorial flub, where it's possible that in the world building, we had not decided to create this problem yet. That is possible. Okay. Uh, so, so okay. So, either Matthew's a big fat liar, or it's a retcon. Yes? Do we think, uh, would we even call it a retcon? We would, even if it's a flub. Like, it's still a retcon. Like, it's not a good one. It's definitely the negative version of it, if it is. In which, you know, we created a problem that we didn't know was a problem, and now it's a problem. That type of retcon. (laughs) And retroactively turn Matthew into big fat liar. (laughs) Right. We do a great deal of character damage to create some, like, some major conflict for this book. Because also, like... The whole premise of the first book, right, is, like, going from complete, like, independent ships passing in the night to, like, a unit that will go forward and, like, be together and change the world. And there were lots of ways to complicate that that we have already, like, begun to address without being, like, etch-a-sketch. That didn't actually happen. Let's just shake that thing up. Right. That was a and like, that was a garbage picture. Let's start over. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad pancake. Toss it out. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> so my argument for it being Matthew's big fat liar and unfortunately not an authorial flub or retcon is the pin that I stuck in Baldwin smelling Diana when they left each other at the airport. Because that, to me, has always been Matthew saying that they're mated and Baldwin knows that they aren't. Because he purposely smells her before he leaves. And that's a big problem, you guys. (laughs) Yeah, it's a problem in the sense that, like, it... It it adds a lot to the, like, problematic Matthew column when we really didn't need a lot more in the problematic Matthew column. <laughs> Betrayal of trust in a relationship, you guys, is, is a big problem. <laughs> Not a little one. And this, this isn't even, like, lying about, like, yes, I did the dishes and when you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. As opposed to normal marital lies. Like, I don't know what happened to that thing you really like that I don't. You know, that, that item. The dog I don't broke know what it. Happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened to that thing our mother-in-laws gave us, you know. I... This is not that lie. <laughs> no, this is not. I don't know where your old gym shorts are. I don't know that. Uh... Really? We're <laughs> not mated? I <laughs> That's what you get from me talking about gym shorts. Is that <laughs> you and I are not mated. Nice. Uh, so, yes. And when we have already... We are trying to do two things simultaneously. Which is build up, like, Diana's implicit, thorough trust of Matthew. Because she's been like, yep, gonna do the Elizabethan vacation. This is the best idea. Trust in your authority. And, like, all the things that you do. And then we are constantly undermining it with the sneaking into the rooms, with the, uh, you know, the various and sundry secrets and lies. And the very foreboding, or is he, that we had in the... You guys, I don't know if I could talk about this (laughs) in a positive way. (laughs) Well, okay. Mm. All right. Okay. Mm. So, so, taken at its best as a device... It forces a hard freaking reset mm-hmm. on a relationship that desperately needs one. And also, I think, goes to Philippe's understanding of, like, what is broken in Matthew. Yes. 
that doesn't make it it doesn't make it feel good it it does not feel good um it does not feel good because on the other side in addition to the lying we clearly in this whole discussion of mating have matthew's deep 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 lies to himself about what makes this okay I get it, right? That you have this romantic. I think. I think we should maybe have a discussion at some point about whether Matthew, we think he's a Byronic hero or like some other kind of a thing. But I get it that you want to have that you want to problematize Matthew and like. If we're gonna have a dark side of Matthew, then I think it is worthwhile for the story to explore that darkness and talk about where it comes from and like the parts of Matthew that can be fixed and the parts of Matthew that cannot. Got it. And it's okay for Matthew to have secret pain. It is not great for him as a character that that secret pain involves like interior and exterior duplicity. That it's not just about his secrets, it's about the fact that Matthew actually factually is always lying to someone. (laughs) And it is often to himself. Yeah. And it's not secrets and lies, you guys. It's It's just lies. It's really just lies. (laughs) And... It's also something that we get over within the space of a chapter. This doesn't even take the whole section for us, for Diana to move past it. Literally in chapter nine, they're making out in the doorway. So if it were me and not Diana, I would have a lot more trouble with this. Like, I don't know that this would be a deal breaker because I agree. She is utterly like utterly dependent uh, here and doesn't really have anywhere to go. But uh, is thinking you're married to somebody, but finding out you're not in any way that matters a deal? No, I mean, deal breakers. (laughs) You know what I mean. (laughs) Oh, a deal breaker for you as a reader or a deal breaker for you like in a real relationship? (laughs) Obviously in a real relationship. Peace. Right. Adios. You handle your own problems. (laughs) I have... I have nothing to say to you. Right. Like, I mean, if I were Diana, I would probably time walk right back to 2010 and be like, hmm. Mm. Let's just leave that problem well mm. in the past, shall we? <laughs> right. Right, right, right. But it is also a... But they're also meant to be together. And we're dealing it with a story in which it is fated or implied that it's fated for them to be uh, together vis-a-vis the Book of Secrets, the Book of Life. So... Right, right. And so, I mean, the promise of the romance and the promise of what this really fascinating article that I read called Erotic Faith, uh, for lack of a better term, the idea that, like, again, you are redeemed by, you are made worthy by the singular monogamous romantic love of this person the create completed by the creation of a family with them like that is the promise and the premise of modern romance right um that you uh, when you are privileging that story about the path that we are taking to get to that transcendence i believe that that means that sometimes on that path You find a way to ford the river even when the bridge is gone. Uh Uh-huh. The bridge, by the way, 100% gone now, guys. (laughs) Yeah, and I... Mm. If it was just, like, if it was just part... If it was just part of their relationship, if it was, if it was just, like, maybe they had, like, a witch's ceremony, and so they were, like, meaningfully married to the community of witches like that would be better if they were meaningfully married in the community of human like if one of these three things were true this would be like a little bit better but because like we're lying about two out of the three and the third one never happened like (laughs) yeah 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 and (laughs) if i think i think if it if it had been me this conversation the conversation that we are getting in i mean 112 in 13, chapter 9 yeah, yeah. the chapter the conversation that we get on 120 and 121 why we didn't have those the first time we go to Setur, why we don't have that when he comes back from oxford i will never right. ever know right 
and we definitely had a lengthy conversation about the things that could have happened during those conversations. <laughs> right. But because Diana breezes past it, we will essentially have to swallow it. We with have her to. Even yeah, we have to. And we swallow it, I think, because we are subverting or we are subsuming the damage that it does to Matthew and Diana's relationship into the issue of fixing Matthew's relationship with his father and, like, getting him to grow up. Yeah. And the unfortunate part is, like, while we have to swallow this and move on, and as, like, terrible as that is for a reader... It's not even, like, it is kind of in, like, the top three worst things that happen with Matthew in the book. Like, the worst transgressions of Matthew. But it's not even the worst one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but, right. Which is why Shadow of Night Matthew is generally, for me, worst Matthew because of things like this. Because we do this kind of damage to the relationship with Diana in service of fixing Matthew or exploring Matthew while not actually doing much of the repair work or by glossing over the repair work with a great deal of sort of uh, faded right. destiny. Which is, which is It'll all work quite frankly, not Happily. enough rehabilitation for a reader to do this for these readers. For these readers. I think that there are people that feel differently and we should, there is absolutely space to disagree with us. If you believe as one of our readers, and I don't say that facetiously, I say, if you believe that there is evidence for this actually being reckoned with in the course of the text, I would be fascinated to see it. I would be curious to hear your perspective. This is, I'm going to say, this is how we feel about this moment because of what it does to Matthew. Right. And the fact that it's really the rehabilitation for us is just not there as readers yeah and it is very much glossed over like you said so anyway (laughs) but then but then philippe gets right to i think the heart of it by on 113 saying that giving someone your whole life is meaningless if you're still holding something of yourself back if there's some part of you that you can't give if there's some part of you no matter what it is that you cannot share um, then you ha- you don't really understand what you were doing. And we get Philippe's protection, which is awesome. And uh, I do enjoy a lot that Philippe's like, you guys are not staying together. <laughs> like, that's not a thing that's happening. She's under my protection now. She's staying by herself and she's staying near me so I can protect her. <laughs> But I love that Philippe is inserting accountability in a way that nobody else in this story can for Matthew. Philippe is, and he explicitly says that he's introducing consequences, but the accountability for his secrets, for his his half-truths, for his pretty lies, as Philippe calls them, like... I don't know if I were Matthew that I would want to be in the room with Diana overnight because I think if I were (laughs) Diana, I would rip him limb from limb. Yeah. Yeah. And, and ultimately, I mean, Philippe is really the only one who can bring down those consequences because we, as we've already seen, um, our Izzy boo is not capable of bringing consequences down in a meaningful way on Matthew. She's just not either because she won't, or because she can't, and it's unclear. <laughs> what do you think Philippe is doing on 114, where he says, you have been outmaneuvered, Matthias. I don't know what you've been doing with yourself, but it has made you soft. What do you think he is talking about? What, uh, like the softness? Well, I think he's right. I think Matthew has been wallowing and mourning and doing a lot of... Um, He's been, you know, researching creature origins and reflecting on species, but he hasn't done a lot of (laughs) self-reflection. Like, he hasn't reckoned with any of these aspects of his own character. He's been too busy, you know, looking at the secrets of the universe, as it were. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's also that Philippe is having a conversation about accountability and responsibility, and that in order to... I think that the softness that he perceives is that Matthew has been indulging his own feelings to the point of paralysis and that he has been 
unable to act. He's been, been unable to make necessary choices to make commitments in a way that, I mean, Philippe is about nothing if not commitment. You know, the man is... If you're in, you're in with Philippe. Like you can't, you can't have Z anything. <laughs> yeah, and as we talked about in the discovery of witches, like Matthew had certainly in the first half of the book distanced himself from all of the family responsibilities and from the responsibilities of the Knights of Lazarus, and you know just kind of let everything become semi close to defunct. You know, <laughs> with like the five guys that he's got in the Knights of Lazarus and not paying attention to any of the family business so yeah but then that that thread that's running through that is that what we have seen so far in my read is Matthew demonstrating what he believes authority to be and Philippe telling him that authority is something very different and that authority involves involves the accept acceptance of risk and consequences and making choices in a way that Matthew has been unwilling to do. Matthew has been so busy protecting that he's been unwilling to address risk and reward. Mm-hmm. And then we're in chapter nine. Mm-hmm. Making out in the doorway. <laughs> I know, but then I love how Philippe interrupts and you're too old to moon about in antechambers. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. I love that Philippe is always around the corner, be like, ah, 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 like, you're still grounded. You are still grounded. Mm-hmm. I see you reaching for that phone. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and then we do housework. We we do women's work. And go hunting. Yeah. We do women's work, which I have mixed feelings about because on the one hand, I really enjoy Diana being very 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 active and actually proactive shrewd and you know proactive in this chapter which is awesome at the same time she's playing the game she's like okay so you're putting me in the kitchen i get it (laughs) i'm gonna play along um so at least she kind of like realizes that she's being relegated to quote unquote women's work it's still super gross perhaps philippe is my charitable view is that Philippe is just trying to separate Matthew and Diana as much as possible. Yeah, but I also think that he is testing Diana's mettle. You know, I think I think that he is he is looking to see oh, sure. whether she is capable of rising to a challenge. You know, whether she is capable of assuming authority. Because the thing the thing that Philippe now knows, right, is that if this is to be and he, Philippe, is not present, then there is a possibility that Matthew is, if not the head of the family, then close, right? You know, and whether he has made a choice that is to the benefit of Philippe and his family and all of his plans. And I I think that that's what what he is doing. Um, I think, I mean, my personal opinion is that had this not gone as well in this chapter had had Diana not risen to the challenge I think that our chapters with Philippe would end very differently Mm -hmm. with them still not married yes (laughs) or made it I know I know yeah um I know I'm sorry okay oh but but I love I love I love on page 119 and just because like it touches on all like these really big themes I love when Diana asks what she should call Philippe, and he says, everyone here calls me either sire or father. Which would you prefer? And she she explicitly goes with, like, the familial patriarchal, like, you did not make me, but I understand that you are responsible for me with father. You know, like, I see that I see you patronizing me. I see you putting me in this subordinate position to you. And you know what? I'm going to own it, you son of a bee sting. Love it! <laughs> I'm going to make myself part of the family, not one of your <laughs> servants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ooh, and then we have a fight. Then we have a fight. And then we do this, like, weird vampire chastity tropey thing about that, like, once you have the vampire sex, there's no backtracking. That's just those vampire male parts are just world-changing. 
And more importantly, vampires are essentially beasts <sighs> like all romantic men. And once you start, you can't stop. It's just a... Mm-hmm. Yep. That's def- totally. definitely totally. the reason we haven't had sex yet. <laughs> not any of the other right, right. issues but where was this conversation about like the whole like once we have sex there is no going back for me there is no vampire divorce like where was that when he you mean in the previous book right when like she's like <laughs> i would like to have sex with you and he's like no thank you yeah which uh, we agreed at the time consent is important it's perfectly fine for him to say no however information and trust in a relationship in exchange of information and communication is important and this is a thing when you know that she is hurt because you ostensibly care about her and love her when you know that she's hurt by your response maybe this is what you come back with maybe the like once i do this there is no going back for me like that's maybe how we handle yeah. it that was certainly the time for that conversation in the last book about halfway through a discovery of witches <laughs> but we do this what I think I love about this chapter is the acknowledgement and subversion of the gender norms of the time and of the patriarchy and the idea, exploring the idea that there is just as much power in being the master of a particular domain, that there is still ground to be gained, even though it is not, uh, it is not the idealized 21st century view of how female power should look there is still power here and she is absolutely subverting philippe's dominance in this chapter and that's what i love about it i mean power there if you know how to use it if you know what it is and how to use it and when it's appropriate to use it Mm -hmm. to your benefit Mm -hmm. which she does very effectively by the end of the chapter she certainly does what do we think of the blood scene at the end no the one before that uh, in the kitchen Yes. I don't know. I can't say that I've given it much thought, but that's potentially because every time I read this chapter, I'm still angry from chapter eight, so it's difficult for me. What do you think about it? I think it is our introduction into this thing that we do on 125 through 128, really, where Diana is reconnecting with her witch self in a way that she hasn't had the privilege of doing since she's come to the past, Um, that she is like voluntarily reconnecting with an understanding of herself as a witch and remembering what she's been taught by Mart and like using her power, like letting her power happen basically with the stag's blood and feeling what the stag felt. And I do actually really like on 126 and 127, this thing that we do with the rosemary for remembrance and the the shame that she says that she feels about not knowing how to use the herbs the way that Sarah would know or that any self-respecting witch would know like the she's gone from being ashamed of being a witch to being ashamed that she has not been a better witch and connecting that to Again, what I think that a lot of these, what this chapter or this this part with Philippe is saying about remembrance and honor of the past. And so anyways, I think that that's. And a, and a bit that like she herself has let her family down, like since this section is a lot about family and expectations. So like, you know. And about lineage and inheritance, right? Like what do you inherit from the people that go before you? Because it's pretty clear that while Matthew inherited Philippe's position in certain ways, he did not inherit in many ways the best of Philippe, of the best of his father. And whether that I mean, I think the text makes an argument that that's willful as opposed to organic. Yes. Potentially uh, I don't know if it's partly Philippe or partly because he hates certain other members of the family and wanted to be as far away from them as possible. <laughs> um, but to the detriment that he did not, uh, that s- certain aspects of Philippe's character did not carry over because Matthew simply wasn't interested in being around. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 For understandable reasons, but you know. <laughs> right. But then we also get like these snippets of Philippe like on page 129 where he talks about the boys riding Matthew like a bear (laughs) and how he likes adventure stories and you get a softness to Philippe that Matthew 
so far has been unable to show because he's not com- like his vulnerability is so deeply embedded in his pain like Philippe is in many ways his vulnerability his pain about Philippe and so with it sitting right there in front of you like it's really hard not to see why Matthew can't uh can't soften the way he ought the way he can't open because like when you're faced with this and faced with what that loss is you understand Matthew's anger a bit better even if that doesn't that doesn't erase the lying but and i i mean for me i think i can i can happily um end the chapter just with diana's line about uh what do you know of partridge blood and fasting and she says more than i did yesterday Mm -hmm. right like she's actively learning and growing and she is having a conversation with herself about worthiness and growth that i think is super super important and it's growth through competence and growth through acceptance of responsibility and growth through not running away from something that is hard or difficult or scary and that's right which has been her mo up to you know this chapter yeah and and the fact that she she recognizes the fact that matthew cannot be the leader now and so she has stepped into that role and she is now taking care of him and making sure that he has the things that he needs. Like he is eating basic self care that he is going to deal with these problems for as, <laughs> as long as it takes. <laughs> right. But most, I think arguably most importantly, she is finally seeing Matthew's vulnerability, right? Whereas in much of a discovery of witches, like we had, the brooding secret dark pain over like I'm just really old and I really miss all my friends but now she's seeing that his real vulnerability has to do with like this giant void in his life of and the fear of not being able to stand up to the expectations of his father figure yeah and I mean the the vulnerabilities that are easy for us to give to other people are not the most important ones (laughs) The first ones that we give up are not not the biggest problems. And so. that is true in real relationships as well. So to an extent, you know, it's I, I appreciate that we're doing this work um, in a romance in the second act. Arguably, the, or at least what is in the trilogy of the second act. And that's about all I have to say about chapter nine. Um, yes. Um, and next time... We get to talk about 10 and 11, and that is going to be a very long conversation. (laughs) Yeah. That's going to be a really long conversation. But we will save that conversation for next time. For now, if you'd like to talk to us about this episode, if you have feelings about Philippe, if you have feelings about anything we've said so far about Shadow of Night, you can find us at Chamomile and Clove on Twitter at Chamomile and Clovecast at gmail.com. Yes, and you can find us on our Facebook page for the podcast, which is Chamomile and Clove Podcast, or the discussion group, group which is the Chamomile and Clove Clovers. Um, and you can also use the hashtag CC Alchemy on Twitter to find us. There are so many ways. <laughs> Right, and then you can also find us on our website at chamomileandclovecast.wordpress.com. Again, we will be presenting at All Souls Con from uh, August 12th, pardon me, August 10th through the 12th in Philadelphia. If you'd inter- da, 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 da. if you'd be interested in an online pass for, I believe it's still $5, to watch us present at All Souls Con, you can find that at allsoulscon.org. Yes, indeed. And we look forward to talking to you next time for chapters 10 and 11 for perhaps an extra long episode and until then thanks for listening thanks for listening tonight Bye. Bye.